Well, thank you very much. Before I start, I think I probably should say something about um, uh, the title here. I guess I was in a sort of uh, whimsical mood when I put this together. So you have both uh, uh, a kind of a Dr. Seuss uh, kind of sensibility there, but most especially this guy from The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> which you may remember, nobody gets to see the wizard. Not no one, not no how. Um, let me start by saying that I'm going to be pulling together um, my remarks from some recent things that, recent and forthcoming uh, things that, uh, that I have published. Uh, much of it will come from a piece called The Way We Were, Rethinking the Popular in a Flat World. That's a special uh, a, a double uh, uh, issue of Analytica and Revista de Analyse y Teoria Musical um, that will show up probably next summer sometime. A number of us were asked to write um, pieces sort of reflecting on what is the popular, uh, pop, you know, what is popular music, uh, this kind of thing. And so a lot of what I'm saying today will come from that. Uh, also, I'm going to, with regard to curriculum, talk, uh, blend in some things that I've um, already done with the, this piece, Rock Me Maestro, not my title, uh, from the Chronicle of Higher Education from uh, uh, last year. Uh, my review of Bob Freeman's The Crisis of Classical <coughs> Music uh, on uh, mus in Music Theory Online uh, a few from months back. And then also, I'll be talking a bit about a proposed curriculum that we have posted at the Institute for Popular Music for the BA uh, and Bachelor of Music. Uh, Institute for Popular Music doesn't offer any courses, and it, to tell you the truth, it doesn't even reflect the curriculum that my, my own department is using right now. It's rather a proposed curriculum that, and that's our kind of contribution to the, the recent debates about curricular reform that we've, uh, that we've been hearing about. John? In his 2005 best-selling book, The World is Flat, Thomas L. Friedman posits the idea of an emergent flat world created by digital technology and increased globalization. In the United States, the recent 20, uh, 20 years have also seen the emergence of what might be thought of as a flat world of musical styles, a reshaped cultural environment in which many listeners and scholars no longer view classical music as necessarily more sophisticated than other styles. The highbrow, lowbrow distinction that once made the engagement with classical music a marker of intellectual sophistication and even superiority has largely been replaced by a sense that any style of music may be interesting and sophisticated in its own way. The result of this flattening of the hierarchy of musical prestige places the meaning of the term popular music in question. Chronically hard to define, popular music arose as a label not so much because of what the music was, but more importantly because of what it was not. It was not classical music. Over more than a century of writing, scholarship, and discussion, non-classical styles of music have been frequently jumbled together with little sensitivity to their salient characteristics, creating the hodgepodge domain of the popular, defined almost entirely by the style that was absent. As the status of classical music proceeds in a flat world, however, how can popular have any meaning? My talk today will trace the ways in which advances in digital technology have hastened the flattening of music stylistic positioning by first considering the advances Friedman enumerates and then the impact of these technological changes on the world of music. The formation of a highbrow, lowbrow distinction in American culture will then be explored along with the discussion of how this distinction played out in American music over most of the 20th century as classical music culture developed. I will then consider music curricula in college level music programs if the world is quickly changing and has perhaps already changed significantly, how do our music programs prepare students for a musical career in a flat world? <coughs> it is always too dangerous to declare a turning point in history. We always tend to feel that when we are alive, something really major is happening. But I am convinced that the genesis of this new flat world platform and the six forms of collaboration it has spawned will be remembered in time as one of the most important turning points in the history of mankind, one no less significant than the invention of the printing press or electricity. Someone had to be alive when it happened, and it happens to be you and me. 
books that predict the future can often have very short shelf lives. All it takes is for a couple of years to pass to make much of the information seem outdated and perhaps even quaint. Thomas Friedman's writing, however, has remained relatively fresh in the decade or so since publication of The World is Flat. There are a few things Friedman did not see coming, the rise of music streaming or the popularity of MOOCs, for instance. But much of what he identifies has indeed come to pass, and much as he described it. The idea at the center of the book that the rise of digital technology has made the world a smaller place and provided dramatically increased access to resources to a greater number of people worldwide has turned out to be accurate. The world is flat, at least in part, because the hierarchical structures that have previously restricted access to resources have been bypassed. In spite of the complaints of some of his critics about the use of the term, it does indeed seem that the world is often at least flat. In the course of his chronicle, Friedman enumerates 10 flatteners that he sees changing the world. These include uploading, outsourcing, insourcing, offshoring, informing, supply chaining, in addition to Windows, Netscape, and workflow software. Friedman traces the history of many of the technological developments he discusses, often following many threads simultaneously while grounding his work in extensive interviews with some of the pivotal figures in technology's advances. As one might expect, the rise of the internet is at the heart of the story Friedman tells, and there are few aspects of our current lives in which this technology has not made an impact over the past two decades. What started for many with using email and accessing websites has developed today into the omnipresence of smartphones and tablets, devices that can provide instant information and communication almost anywhere and at any time. Using a small handheld device, one can easily engage in a video chat, stream music, movies, or television, and even take a college course. Though Friedman did not predict all of this, te the technological developments he outlines have transformed the way we do business the ways we entertain and enlighten ourselves and each other, the ways we relate to one another. While time will tell whether these changes are as deeply transformational to the history of our culture as Friedman believes they are, they certainly seem to be quite significant within the time frame of the last hundred years or so. Perhaps most important to the argument advanced in this talk is that these changes have fundamentally changed the music business and practices of music making as well as transforming the ways fans engage music. What, we might ask, are the consequences of Friedman's flat world for music? As artists and labels sought new directions for revenue, the importance of viral videos, publishing rights, streaming services, and the festival touring circuit continued to grow. In 2011, for the first time since the invention of the photograph, Americans spent more money on live music than recorded. In 2012, North American sales of digital music surpassed the compact disc. In 2013, revenues from subscription and advertised supported streaming passed $1 billion for the first time. While Friedman does not devote sustained attention to the music business, he does mention the rise of Napster as a significant development. There's probably no factor that has more affected the music business in the last 20 years than the practice of file sharing. Ironically, file sharing has made more music available to more people at any time in history, but it has also crippled the record companies that used to ex control access to the music. As technology has made access to recording and distribution of music more democratic, it has simultaneously made it much more difficult for most musicians and their record companies to make money directly from their recordings. A chronicle of how file sharing arose to such importance has its sources in many domains. Digitization of music and the rise of the compact disc is part of the story, as record companies in the 1980s worked hard to convince consumers that vinyl was obsolete, often encouraging fans to buy music they already owned in a new format, and frequently at twice the price. The development of MP3 technology came out of a push to standardize audio and video formats across the industry. It was determined that the MP3 format did the best job all around of compressing CD quality audio, shrinking the size of a file to about 10% of its original size. As it turned out, CD tracks could then be ripped to one's hard drive 
and the greatly compressed files could then be shared on a rapidly developing internet. In many ways, the various paths all led to Napster, the controversial file sharing site that allowed peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and which quickly became the target of the Recording Industry Association of America in 1999. Though the RIAA was successful in shutting Napster down as a hub for illegal file sharing, the practice of file sharing continued to grow rapidly. Steve Jobs and Apple attempted to harness some of this downloading, downloading energy and enthusiasm with its iTunes service and iPod player, but most writers agree that the amount of music fans actually paid for was only a small percentage of what they actually downloaded. The rise of digital recording also flattened the music world as home recording became an affordable option for many bands and artists that previously would have had to pay thousands of dollars simply to use a professional studio. Once musicians had their tracks recorded inexpensively, they could post MP3s on websites that came to specialize in creating such opportunities. Following Friedman's model, musicians no longer had to work through record companies to get their music heard. They could now record the music themselves and distribute it via the internet. What used to require a recording contract could now be accomplished with a laptop, software, and an internet connection. For fans, flattening meant that more music than ever was instantly available and almost all of it free. Eager music fans were surfing the net in search of a wide variety of music, much of it from around the world. Ironic ironically, just as the record business began what would become a steep decline, music was flourishing. The urge to deprecate popular music genres was an important element in the process of sacralization. If symphonic music was divine, then it followed that the other genres must occupy a lesser region. Those who attend classical music concerts, those who attend classical music concerts, plays, dance performances, or musical theater are familiar with the required deportment. Nobody expects the audience to act as if they were at a rock concert. But Lawrence Levine reveals how, in the mid-1800s in the United States, most performances were more like rock shows or even club dates than modern symphony performances. As he chronicles how the notion of highbrow was developed in American culture, he surveys the arts and culture generally. This leads to tales of Shakespearean troops touring the country and playing to crowds that got more involved in the performances than we would ever expect today, sometimes even chasing an actor off the stage if the onstage character offended. So how did the change from such rough and tumble audiences to the docile and polite ones of today's high culture occur? Levine's key concept in chronicling this transformation is the notion of sacralization. The idea that the arts could become almost holy and worthy of focused of contemplation, of worthy of focused contemplation, that they would somehow put us in touch with something higher, either in the world or in ourselves. But the elevation of the arts in this way is not necessarily how it always was. As he writes, one of the central arguments of this book is that because the primary categories of culture have been the products of ideologies which were always subject to modifications and transformations, the perimeters of our cultural divisions have been permeable and shifting rather than fixed and immutable. To accept this thesis is to accept a picture of the American cultural past and present that departs considerably from the images most of us have learned to accept, which is never an easy thing to do. And if highbrow art was not always highbrow art in the past, it could be that it will not remain so in the future. Levine gives us a history of how highbrow was created, but Friedman provides a framework for how it may be transformed. Can a flat world indeed undermine, or at least significantly transform, the highbrow, lowbrow distinction? He particularly esteemed Beethoven's symphonies as the embodiment of ethical striving and considered music as entertainment invalid and corrupt. He inveighed against whatever seemed frivolous, bacchanalian, or exhibitionist. He espoused classical music. Americans of the 1930s, 60% of whom said they liked to listen to classical music, knew who Toscanini was. 
for most people today, Leonard Bernstein is not even a memory. While Levine chronicles the process of sacralization in often relatively broad terms, Joseph Horowitz provides a sweeping account of how sacralization happened in music, <coughs> tracing the story from mid-19th century Boston up to the end of the 20th century. In the, quote, the top quotation I just read, Horowitz is discussing the influences of John Sullivan Dwight, a Boston music critic and journalist. Dwight was a key figure in the sacralization of symphonic music, though by no means the only one. According to Horowitz, it is Dwight who, turned the cur who coined the term classical music, the Bostonian working hard to create an aesthetic and cultural distinction that had not existed in quite the same way before him, in the United States at least. Horowitz tells a tale of two cities, with Boston generally being the center for symphonic music and New York the center for opera, though with extensive interaction between these two music capitals. The musical life of these two American cultural capitals came to define highbrow music. If it was not classical, the distinction went. It was lowbrow entertainment music. The idea of popular music being defined by what it was not thus became the standard. Horowitz sees a second stage in the history of classical music in America, beginning with the rise of conductor Arturo Toscanini. Toscanini's rise was fueled by his charismatic image and his role in the quickly developing history of radio in the 1930s. As radio became increasingly central in American cultural life, Toscanini, armed with the strong support of NBC's top executive, David Sarnoff, became a celebrity in much the same way that Bing Crosby was. Radio made Toscanini a star. <clears throat> what distinguishes Horowitz's account of classical music in America from other histories is that Horowitz places emphasis on the role played by the business of music in its development. As Horowitz considers contracts, managers, venues, broadcasts, and recording deals, we could for a minute forget that he's discussing classical music. His chronicle seems very similar to most histories of popular music. This suggests that the image of classical music as a higher form of expression than <coughs> entertainment music was constructed in the same way that so many other images in the music business have been. One might conclude that the distinction Dwight had worked so hard to achieve was then later solidified in American culture by the same kinds of mechanisms that made Toscanini, Crosby, Judy Garland, and even Clark Gable stars. To a certain and significant extent, highbrow was a marketing category. Since the British invasion nearly half a century ago, it has been socially acceptable, even fashionable, for intellectuals to pay attention primarily to commercial music, and they often seem oblivious to the existence of other genres. Of no other art medium is this true. Intellectuals in America distinguish between commercial and literary fiction, between commercial and fine art, between mass market and art cinema. But the distinction in music is no longer drawn except by professionals. Nowadays, most educated persons maintain a lifelong fealty to the popular music they embraced as adolescents. And generation gaps between parents and children manifest themselves musically in contests between rock styles. When it comes to classical music in American culture, the fat lady hasn't just sung, but Hilda has packed her bags and moved to Boca Raton. <laughs> A quick search on the internet returns dozens of articles, columns, and blogs addressing what is often called the crisis in classical music. Depending on the source, the sales of classical music are thought to constitute about 1.5 to 3% of overall music sales. When the definition of classical music is broadened to include crossover artists and recordings, the sales figures are better. In a flat world in which profits from sales of recordings in all styles are significantly diminished by downloading, as I mentioned a minute ago, the reliance on performing revenue increases. And on this front, classical music continues to struggle. According to Robert J. Flanagan, quote, no, no orchestra in the world earns enough to cover its operating expenses. No orchestra is self-supporting." While it seems clear that uh, classical music's appeal may not be what it once was, it also seems unlikely that it will ever disappear completely. 
the crisis is often framed not so much as a fear that the music itself will disappear, but rather that opportunities to pursue, to pursue a career in classical music will become impossible. In a flat world, there is more classical music available, at least in recorded form, than ever in our history. It is the institutions that have supported classical music, and mostly in professional performance, that are threatened. These will certainly experience change, but these kinds of changes are not restricted to classical music. Many aspects of the music business are being transformed by technology. The most consequential flat world sh shift for this talk has to do with the prestige of classical music. Does classical music remain significant enough by virtue of a continued highbrow status to permit definitions of all other styles in reference to itself? As Richard Taruskin mentions in the quotation I just read, the shift in prestige regarding classical music has been underway for decades, even if, as we'll hear from Robert Freeman, this shift has gone largely unacknowledged by music schools. It is not so much that classical music no longer has the prestige it once did, it is that it now shares that prestige with other styles. Though, as Taruskin points out, the highbrow-lowbrow distinction may still hold in other arts, it seems less definite and defining in music. The flat world of music created by digital technology serves to further weaken the distinction. Indeed, many classical musicians, and especially the younger ones, are eager to capitalize on the technologies and techniques often associated with popular music. In a flat world of music, prestige is still a factor, but it is not restricted to a single style. Horowitz has also reflected on the change of the recent decades. He advocates for the term post-classical music to designate recent concert music. He writes, quote, what does classical music mean today if the term is to retain anything like its old opponent? It must refer to a moment that is now passed into its attendant prestige and influence, end quote. Likewise, when one considers the historical context of how the use of the term popular music has tended to be defined in American music culture, it seems clear that these, the basis for the distinctions it draws are no longer valid or useful. To define all other music by a single style that no longer has exclusive claim to elevated cultural status and is of marginal popularity in the culture at best is an intellectual habit formed by the values and practices of the past. Defining popular music as everything that is not classical music was once a useful distinction. It reflected the American culture of its time and so possessed significant meaning. One could argue, of course, that such a distinction was unfair to the music of its day, lumping various styles together simply by what they were not. But it is at least of historical value to understand why some would have wanted to define it in this way. The collapse of the highbrow, lowbrow distinction facilitated by technological changes of flat world have made the continued use of popular music seem antiquated. Popular music is now, I think, becoming a historical term. In a flat world, classical, rock, jazz, bluegrass, and many other stylistic labels are still useful in organizing the enormous range of music available for listening, study, and performance. But popular music is far too broad to be useful in anything but a historical sense. It is a term that helps us remember, culturally and aesthetically, the way we were. Considering the changes we have seen with regard to music and our culture, how does all this impact the ways in which we teach music? As we, revision, as we revisit the frameworks we have developed over the years for the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Music degrees, for instance, how well do these programs serve and or prepare our students for the world as it really is? It is a central part of the message of this book that in a world of very rapid change, music teaching, still the predominant way musicians make a living, has been very slow to change, as have the curricula of our major music schools and the pedagogical goals towards which these curricula have been directed. The assumptions that basic study and fundamental musicianship may be put off till college, that the symphony orchestra should remain the backbone of a music school's enrollment plans, that instrumental and vocal students learn optimally from weekly lessons from well-known specialists, and that the road to musical heaven lies straight through the practice room, remains un remain unexplored axioms inherited from the 19th century. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Robert Freeman, he was dean of the Eastman School for over 20 years. 
In a 1995 book entitled Heartland Excursions, ethnomusicologist Bruno Nettle provides a fair-minded examination of what we might call school of music culture. He calls it music building culture. Nettle observes that most programs focus on what he calls a central repertory, which is roughly analogous to what we've been calling classical music here. In fact, the highbrow-lowbrow distinction discussed by Levine and Horowitz the word music in music school is mostly synonymous with classical music. I mean, the school of music basically means the school of classical music, doesn't it? To be fair, many schools offer significant jazz programs, and a, small, and a far smaller number even offer programs in pop music or commercial music. But at the core of our curriculum is still, 20 years after Nettle wrote about it, the central repertory. This probably ought to cause us to pause for at least a moment. The most generous figures in music sales would award as much as 5% of the market to classical music and jazz combined. This seems to me that, in most but in not all cases, we ignore or place a markedly secondary emphasis on 95% of the music the rest of the world seems to want to hear. How could this possibly serve our students well? Even the most narrowly focused classical musician will in most cases emerge from music school into a world that will require that graduate to build a career, often freelancing and teaching. In such an environment, a broader range of musical skills and experience are a significant asset. I have argued elsewhere for what I call the integrated curriculum. At the center of this proposal to reorganize our music programs is the idea that musicians of all types should study together in an environment that challenges all, but which privileges them. I do not think it is beneficial to create a separate education for pop musicians, for instance. Providing instruction in nothing but pop almost amounts to pandering in some cases, though there's certainly tuition revenue to be generated by doing so. <laughs> All students benefit from being pushed outside their musical comfort zones into an experience of music and musical practices that might not other, they might not otherwise have sought out. This is an approach that considers the meaning of music to be broad and inclusive. It does not mean that students could not specialize and develop an extremely high degree of mastery. It's just that we would open up our programs to a broader range of young musicians than we typically do now. Consider this, let's call it, hypothetical case. A flagship state university has a top-ranked music program. Somewhere in that same state, there is an enormously talented and dedicated guitarist who is eager to study music. This student is very accomplished at playing rock music, but has not yet been challenged to broaden her skills. She auditions for programming guitar performance, but cannot really play either jazz or classical. Members of the music school faculty and admission staff recognize the talent of this student, but they do not have a program to put the student in that does not mean either abandoning a focus on performance or changing styles. This school remains dedicated primarily to the central repertory, largely owing to the influence of the performance faculty. In a state in which this student's parents pay taxes, and at a school that is a direct beneficiary of state support, this student ends up going to school somewhere else, probably Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and all because she plays the wrong kind of music. She does not play the 5% generous 5% of music we care about. I ask you, how can this possibly be right? Please don't think this is an unlikely scenario. I have seen it play out many times. It has certainly happened more than once at the Eastman School, which of course is a private school. In case you're still wondering about it, I think things have to change. <laughs> <laughs> we must protect the great tradition of classical music to be sure, and work to maintain the high standards we have established over the years. But we cannot bury our, hands, our heads in the sand when it comes to music in a flat world. This seems obvious to almost everybody <clears throat> but us. <laughs> Within the music school community, we are just now and especially in the last several months even, having debates and discussions that may result in significant changes. The flat world of music brings with it many opportunities and possibilities. We need to embrace these changes and use them to our advantage. Critics might claim that this broader approach to musical education at the college level will ruin the great tradition. The classical music will suffer. But friends, 
Classical music is already suffering mightily. The only chance of saving it within our programs may be to place it within a broader context that is in keeping with the real world of music outside the music school. <coughs> <laughs> we often hear that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I have just uttered about 5,000. But I'll leave you uh, with this meeting of Dr. Seuss and rock music. And always remember the words of the egalitarian words of Horton the Elephant a person's a person, no matter how small. Thank you. Thank you, John. I see we already have a hand up, so we'll take some questions. Is this live? Are you hearing? No. Okay, so let me see if I can do something. Sometimes the batteries run out. I've got another battery. Or you turn the turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Just a nice little kiss in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I teach at a community college in Florida, and I was very um, intrigued by the Toscanini reference and, and then what you said about nobody knows Bernstein and I, I would have to I have to say that with my music appreciation students when I say the word John Williams the name John Williams they all know John Williams and then when you talk about Boston being the you know, classical music but they all know the Boston Pops and I conduct a Pops orchestra so um, I, I find that that film music is in that in that gray area of classical versus pop music and that you do to be a film composer you need to learn music theory and we, we take them down that road can you discuss maybe your thoughts on that uh, on, on, on film music or yes, and, in a curriculum or yes and, and the sort, sort of the hybrid nature of it versus classical versus popular you have yeah. any thoughts? In fact, I think um, well, I'll, I I don't I didn't mean with the big state university to uh, indict the University of Michigan. Although, <laughs> as a proud alum, bachelor's eighty three, master's eighty five, PhD ninety, and a recent uh, recently elected to the alumni board alumni board of governors for the School of Music Theory, I probably have the right to sound pop up if I want to. But really, you wouldn't have to go any farther than the states of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania. It doesn't really matter where you go to find the same situation. You know, the flag skip to ship schools hanging on to classical music. They accepted jazz about 20 years ago. I know of one prestigious, uh, uh, pre one prestigious institute of music somewhere in the Cleveland area in which they're, they have to teach an improvisation class where they're not allowed to use the word jazz in the title because the faculty think it cheapens it. Uh, uh, so one of the first places where schools of music start to dip their toe in water is film music, because as you say, it cues so close to some of the same kinds of skills and concerns that we have, uh, especially since so many of the first that first generation of Hollywood film composers really came from that whole Viennese and German school of Wolfgang Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kohlberg, for, for example, so many of them Richard Strauss kind of. Uh, uh, that school. So that's a, that's a great place to start. I have to say that, um, you know, I'll talk about Eastman. We've kind of gone in that direction. We offer courses about it, but if a student wants to study composition and wants to do film scores, Eastman is not the place to come. You know, we, we've got the George Eastman House. We have a rich tradition in film. We have a fantastic archive of old films. We have an orchestra that performs live along with old films and all that kind of thing. Yet, the school is really not really willing to take that step and I think it's that way a lot of places and especially at the important institutions that here I'll get on my soapbox I'll, I think I've been on it all along um, <laughs> and say it's these schools that should be leading and it's often the smaller let's say less prestigious schools that do the leading and the big ones that do the follow -up. and I think that's a real inversion of what leadership means in school yeah. school of music that's my my diatribe on that. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, you mentioned David Sarnoff and his role in making Toscanini right. the, the name of Hybra. Uh, Sarnoff had also been on the board of the Gramophone Company, which had preceded EMI. And that led to Fred Gaysberg, the first DIY recording engineer. 
with all the um, trend jumping now with schools on entrepreneurship, should we also be looking at musicology as, as incorporating those figures whose business acumen made classical music the, the highbrow business element that it is? So, i.e., the Sarnoffs, yeah. Gaysburg, Henry Wood, etc. Well, that's, I mean, I don't know how we are, are with Joe's, uh, the big book that I quoted here. He's got a number <coughs> of others that kind of work the same theme, probably six or seven other ones. One devoted especially to Toscanini. Um, uh, and Joe's whole page <coughs> is that, um, that to figure out how, the music, how classical music develops, you really have to look at the business side of it. And we have tended not to do that in musicology because, you know, the highbrow distinction means that we are not dirt, our hands are not dirty with these questions of how people make money. An artist follows his or her muse, and you know, and I don't, I don't give a care about your lousy fiddle when the when the spirit strikes me. You know, the famous Beethoven quote, whether he really said it, no, but, it was, but it, it encapsulates the experience, the, un, uh, the, the, the sentiment, the uncompromising dedication to the art, and let's not think too much about the the, the business part of it unless it enhances an argument about the art itself. But in fact, I think musicologists and especially performers need to know that, I mean, this, you know, I, I mean I, I've been in, in, in the business in one way or another, especially, you know, you maybe learn it even more when you do some of the unsuccessful gigs I've done, that, you know, the entertainment business, no matter what kind of music you're doing, is, is, is something you have to learn how to work. I mean, it's a machine you have to learn how to work to your advantage. And you come out of school thinking that someone's just gonna throw a park down in front of you, you're just gonna have to show up and then you're gonna get paid. That's the most naive thought in the world. You have to be ready to go. And musicologists, when they chart the histories and, and think about the repertory, certainly we do it with popular music all the time, you cannot put aside considerations of as we hear from Laura this morning, recording studios, record labels, pressures of agents, what's happening in other music at the time, who's selling, who's selling out. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. And I think popular music brings this awareness to the table. So I think it enriches traditional study, it, 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 as well as sort of buttressing it by adding an element to our portfolio that's actually kind of a money maker, which offsets the, the, the traditional thing, which is a money loser. You can have money losers in your, in your portfolio. They can add prestige, but you can't depend on them unless there's somebody rich who's willing to continue to pay the bill. Patronage is the only solution. John, uh, through what mechanism do you see a change taking place? Through what mechanism do you see a change taking place at the institutions you were referring to? How do you see that uh, scenario see where out? that comes about? I know some of us are chewing around the edges in various ways and pushing it a little bit here and there, but yeah. what do you see? Well. My, my guess is this, if I put myself in a position of Friedman and try to look ahead 10 years, maybe 15 or 20 years, things happen slowly. I mean, um, you know, we've got tenure, you have, to, you, have to, you have to work within the communities of tenure professors that you have. You can't just be a, a, a new boom that sweeps clean. That's just not the way the academy works. And it's probably a good thing. We're a little bit conservative, but it means that we don't take a lot of crazy twists and turns like businesses do, you know, and end up bankrupt or something. Um, but here's what I see happening. The most prestigious schools, the schools that have, have the highest prestige in doing classical music will probably remain doing that, uh, because they can. Um, we could populate our classes at Eastman probably about 12 times on the basis of our uh, admissions and applications, right? So we can continue to be as narrow as we want, and we'll continue to be successful. A school like Michigan, Indiana, Florida State, uh, some of the really big ones with big names can continue to do that. But you know, if you read the Chronicle of Higher Ed, you see it all the, and you look at these quartiles and all these various kinds of things, I mean, you notice that like 90% of the schools out there aren't the big ones we talk about all the time. And those people really do have to meet a bottom line. And so they've got to get students. We heard, um, we heard Ruth talk yesterday about the students walking in the other direction sometimes from what it is that we're teaching. So those schools are gonna to have to change or die. Or, or, or start to lose faculty or have programs slashed and these kinds of things. And popular music does definitely bring students in through the door. Uh, you know, we can be idealistic and talk about the context in which we want popular music to, uh, to, to be taught in our curriculum, but we have to have curriculum for that to be taught in, <laughs> in the first place for us to get fussy. So I, I think that what the, the, change, the change starts not at the top schools. I mean, I, I'm, 
I, I'm disappointed to say that I do not see leadership in that direction. The only schools that I see offering leadership in that direction that are of what we might think of as the, the elite music schools in the country are USC, where Rob Cudietta has put together a fantastic program that blends together popular music and classical music now in a kind of integrated curriculum. Rob says he can only accept about 5% of the people that apply to that program at USC. By the way, most of them are full pays. So for those of you who are administrators, that's the, the sort of the golden goose. Um, and uh, and he says that when parents ask him, where else could my kid go to get an education like this? He says, I don't know. Uh, he's being a little bit self-serving. He says that there are probably a number of other places, but I mean, we can start to list them on the fingers of both hands before we can come to it. Uh, there's an enormous opportunity waiting there for the school that wants to really to go in this direction. But you've got to get it past your faculty. And what faculty hear when they hear change is, you don't value me, you don't value what I do. But hell no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> and so you, it takes an, an awful lot of persuasion to convince people who've always saw a violin or piano and who want to keep history that they're gonna be able to keep doing that, especially if we broaden the curriculum in those kinds of ways so we can find new ways of paying for it. But they're not a lot of times wanting to hear that just yet. I think this last year has been a fantastic period because everywhere we go, we're hearing people talking about changing the curriculum. So maybe this is that moment. But it takes time. It takes time for any group of people to get used to change. And so we shouldn't expect it to happen overnight. That would probably have a backlash that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't push us in the right direction. What I think is the right direction. Um, as we try to make this case for more popular music in the curriculum, how important is it to have a unified definition of what popular music is? Well, as you heard me say, I'm, I mean, me getting up here and or putting it in this article that I'm uh, publishing and saying that popular music is a historical term won't just make itself. I mean, we're gonna, I mean, I direct the Institute of Popular Music. So, I mean, I'm, uh, to a certain extent, it's a kind of a theoretical point which is to say that if we think about popular music, we are at the same time accepting the distinction between classical music and popular music and accepting the prestige and the exclusivity of a form of music to define ourselves. And I say that the first step is rejecting that entirely. I do not accept the idea that I, as a musician, am defined by my relationship to classical music. I will define that relationship to classical music. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, so from my point of view, I say, let's not talk popular music. Let's talk music. Let's talk diversity. Let's, call, let's talk inclusion. Let's talk about those kids in our state who are, or, or in our region or whoever, whoever we draw from who are talented, who we should be serving, but we can't because we don't have the programs to address what it is they do. And we, we don't want to have to force them to do something else. I mean, uh, these are the ways that get away from the, the notion that we're just wanting to talk about the music of our favorite band, I think, which is what a lot of people probably suspect of us, and which in some cases is kind of true. I still like to talk about the SMG. <laughs> but you know, the, the idea is that there are broader issues, I think, culturally at stake here than just the inclusion of a repertoire. Because, you know, I'm a rock guy, but you know, rock is on the wane. And 20 years from now, it's not going to be about getting rock into the curriculum. That's rock is going to be the new jazz. You know, it's going to be the old stuff that doesn't seem edgy in, in any way anymore. Uh, and so it can't just be about pushing a particular repertoire. It has to be about, about taking down that wall you know, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. And take it down and leave it down. And, and bring in programs that play on your strengths and your weaknesses, your existing faculty, and try to get as close to that ideal of offering a place to every talented position as you possibly can, without asking to turn into somebody else who is speaking. Can I just, one thing about that? I think that's excellent because, I mean, popular music, everything is popular. That's one of the common definitions, is that music that is liked by a large, a majority of the people. So if you go back in history, Haydn was popular music, Handel was popular music. So if you're looking to unite music and to, popular music is not different. Uh, in the future, rock will be this new, you know, Haydn, or, you know, it'll be the new, Whatever broke music, so I, I I like that approach. Thank you very much, John. So, um, might we look when we think of curricular change? Might we really look carefully at how curriculum is structured and focus on the how we engage students with music, production, consumption, can. 
and, and not be so concerned about the what. I find in any curricular conversations, we get so hunkered down about what we're going to teach. Right. And we, we really sometimes miss the point of how, <coughs> how we are engaged in music and all the contextual, political, social, cultural, right. as well as aesthetically. Yeah. And I, mean, I think if we examine the structures perhaps more carefully. Yeah, and I, I, will, I will say that, I mean, I, I agree with that um, in, in, in a lot of senses, but here's the, for me, the, maybe, maybe the, the place where, I don't know if I'll differ from you or not, I don't know, but here's how I, was, I would break that away a little bit. And that is, I think that all this talk about curricular reform at the college level, we kind of conflate the Bachelor of Arts degree with the Bachelor of Music degree. Now, a Bachelor of Arts degree, as we always say, should be a mile wide and an inch deep, which means what we want to do is we want to open up horizons. We want to get kids thinking about things they haven't thought about before for different kinds of angles. The last thing you want to do is make it as narrow as a Bachelor of Music program. A Bachelor of Music program, though, is more akin to getting a nursing degree or a pharmacy degree or something. It's a professional shingle or a music education degree. It says you have certain skills. So I think the question you ask in the case of a Bachelor of Music degree is, what do students need to be prepared to enter the profession? Not do what I, not what do I think they should be like, or what do I think they should, how, how they should cha create change in their uh, in their culture. Those are great questions. But when you offer a professional degree, and especially a private school like Eastman, where it's costing fifty thousand dollars a year, I mean, you know, uh, you really have to think about trying to. Uh, uh, I think you make you should make it too vocational in that in that sense. But you do have to think about what the profession requires. In a BA, however, I think that's the place to really start opening it up. And you know, maybe the the, the case will be that we'll have a lot more BA students than Bachelor of Music students uh, in, in, in the future. Maybe that's the way. But that's what that's what Freeman, uh, Freeman, Robert Freeman argues for. Uh, and so that's where the structures are going to be very different. And in a, a BA degree, I'm for come one, come all, try everything, anything that lights up the spark of interest in a student. I mean, like we, we, we all talk about this, that we only have so much time with the kids, as if everything they need to know about something should be contained in our courses. But my feeling about it is what we need to do is effectively light a spark in the students and let them pursue some of these issues and ideas for the rest of their lives. And if we can do that in just a couple of cases around music, I think it has real effects. We just never know where that place is going to be for which students. Now, Bachelor of Music program, you don't really need to light the spark because they've already kind of made that decision. Now you've got to get them ready to go out there and, 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 and lead a rich musical life that has a lot of opportunities for success. I, I think you brought up a lot of really awesome points and very interesting stuff. Um, so one of my larger questions is, uh, about the you know the, the way to get this out here, and I think it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg you know thing. We it's something we value at the at the level of the before you know um, people get to college, and then you know part of that is people te the teacher are teaching the way they taught. And I know that with our organization, you know every time I go observe a teacher that's teaching at the elementary or the middle school or high school level, um, they have a tendency to speaking of high brow, low brow. This is one of my particular you know angst with this is uh, you know. The, the teachers will end up doing the popular music they are familiar with. So the yeses, the progressive rock, the things that are deemed kind of, uh, you know, uh, theoretically challenging enough become the things that are brought into the classroom, whereas we're really just kind of taking the music the kids are listening to currently and still saying that's still not really appropriate for the classroom. And, and so the, my question really is how do we determine that? I'm, I'm just looking at the sessions going on later on today. I love seeing that we have the Radiohead session going up at the same time as the heavy metal session, which is basically the equivalent if you're going to talk from a theoretical point of view of, you know, the differences between Schoenberg and, you know, Philip Glass. And, and it, how do we incorporate all of that? Just, you know, under the popular music veil, there's already so much diversity in terms of, of the way that you can even discuss it or get to it. Well, I mean, I, I think in some ways what your question gets to is what might be is the sort of other side of canon, right? When we talk about the canon, usually it's to say we shouldn't have such a thing. Uh, but <coughs> there's up canons and said, that's an awesome thing, this canon thing. I, like it, I only have this many pieces to talk about. It's crazy. Uh, nobody ever says that. But, the, you know, the, the, the practice would not have continued for generations if it weren't pedagogically useful. And the usefulness of canon is that it restricts the material that you need to know. 
once you take canon away and say, well, no, it's not just, it's, it's just music, in, in the words of Sam Phillips, it's just music, baby, just music, baby. Um, <laughs> that's awesome, but then it opens it up so wide that now how do I choose which music? And, you know, that's, I think that's, a, that's an issue that each person is going to have to deal with in their own context. I, my solution is to talk about the music that I'm passionate about and that I know the most about. And so what the pink kids do, if I, if I talk to a, a high school group or something about the music that I like to talk about, they, they may go and listen to that music, they may like it, they may not like it, but what they see, what you model for them is the behavior of somebody who's talking articulately about a music they believe in with a certain kind of passion. And I always feel like the things the kids are going to remember from my classes are, are not going to necessarily be the things I put on the test, but the ways in which I talked about it and the ways in which I engaged it. And I think that whatever music you choose, if you can model a behavior that shows, that displays that engagement, you may be giving some, them something a lot more valuable than whatever factoids you hope they'll absorb from the particular thing you talk about at that time. So that may be a bit of a, 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 a deflection. You'd say, well, I don't want to deal about that question. Let me talk to you about modeling, you know. Um, but I, 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 that's kind of the only move you're left with. You know, I mean, if I go into a high school class, the last thing I want to do is try to play something to them that they're hip to and I'm not. You know, then you just look at the old guy pathetically trying to with it for the kids, you know. Much much better to have the authenticity of saying, you know, I saw a hard day's night in the movie theaters in 1964 and they're like, oh, like, like touching an old man. I met a real one, somebody who was really there. This is great, you know. That's probably a better a better crutch to rely on than not to be a hip. You know, there's, there's no way I'm going to be hip with the eyes of a 14-year-old. I've learned that time and time again. <laughs> Trevor. I don't know if I need the mic here. My, well, Walt's got the mic. Thanks, uh, you know, we, you've talked a lot, and I think other people have talked a lot about curricular reform in the undergraduate program, but for better or for worse, we kind of have this top down situation where people with graduate degrees are the people that influence the curriculum. Right. And, I mean, how much do you think the importance? A curricular form in graduate programs for theory or music education or what have you uh, is required. I mean, there's a time, maybe it's past, that every PhD program in theory needed a Shankarian and a set theory person. Um, but I, it's not yet that we need every graduate theory program needs a pop person or a jazz person. And just for my own uh, PhD program, which you know I graduated pretty recently, there was no jazz core or pop music core per se. So. Uh, what would you think about that, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, you're right. I mean, what we, it's amazing how much of what we teach, in, we're ta now we're talking about graduate theory, but it might be graduate music policy. How much of what we teach in those courses is geared toward what we think theory people will have to teach when they get out of school. And the expectation for those of you that are less familiar with the theory discipline is that those of us who get a PhD in theory, when we uh, interview for an entry-level job or any kind of a teaching job, it's expected that we should be able to teach any course in the undergraduate curriculum. Maybe you wouldn't do the 16th century counterpoint one, or maybe you prefer the 18th century counterpoint, but whatever, we're supposed to be able to do all of that. And so in many ways, our graduate programs are geared toward that. The primary way of funding the students is to have them teach a TA. And so that's the way to do So I think that that starts to change. Um, the graduate program, in a certain sense, starts to change in terms of the required courses or the required things that they can do when, when the core curriculum starts to change. On the other hand, I have to say that the happiest place in all of this with regard to the integration of popular music is in scholarship. I mean, uh, for those of us that were at SMT a few weeks ago and at AMS last week, popular music scholarship is busting out all over. And, and what the publishers are finding is a kind of a gold rush for people who are all trying to sort of get new titles of people who haven't done it before. They're all of a sudden, they're talking about all kinds of things. And it's just like, it's almost too much of a, a good thing. But that's, that's happening in the scholarship and lots of publication. We're not yet to the point where that has, if you want to use the word, trickled down or had an impact on the undergraduate curriculum yet, but it will. I, I, I feel sure that this is not just a passing fad, this year's hula hoop or pet rock or moon ring, that <laughs> in fact there'll be more longevity to it than that. And I think over the next five to 10 years, you have to be patient in academia. It just takes time for things to change. Things have to go through curriculum committees. Everybody's got to get their oil in the water. Sometimes it takes a couple of years to get things to change much. And they sometimes change in increments. So I think graduate study will change in terms of the required stuff. Um, when, when what we're going to have to be teaching when we get out of the job changes. Uh, but I think in many ways, 
that you were able to do the dissertation that you did at East Bay with Jocelyn and the first ones that you spent to do a pop music dissertation were able to do that is already a really strong indication of how that's different from where it was for Walt and I and Laurie back in 1990 when we gave that first big paper at AMS SMT and Bob Galden chaired it and graded counterpoint <laughs> uh, homework while he was chairing our session. <laughs> it's a different world now, isn't it? Questions? Yeah, this I guess is kind of a follow up to over there, but uh, and to the last point, um, how much of this resistance is not just resistance against teaching pop music, but against teaching industry stuff specifically, given how much pop music is wrapped up as a kind of like industrial product? Um, and I'm thinking here, you know, uh, the ways universities might look down on. Um, Technical or professional programs, which you know prepare people to be you know, recording okay, sure. studio editors, and you know s slot them into that kind of. So those programs exist, but they exist at that level, that's sort of below the university, um, at least in terms of the way the university would feel about the music program. So how much of that resistance comes towards that, and then if, if there is resistance to that. How does that curriculum form happen unless there's a kind of a greater embrace of? Well, I think you're right to, to, to point out that there's a cultural element there that has to do with the idealism of art, art of any kind, not just art music, but art of any kind, not being polluted or contaminated by commerce. Uh, and that's a wonderful idea. Um, and uh, in many cases, I'm sure that it happens. But you, you'd, have to, you'd have to come up with a, a particular artist musician whose life was entirely lived according to those principles of what we tell them, doll tale. There's the one we tell the music appreciation one about the heroic composers, but you know, you ever read those Beethoven letters? You ever seen some of those publication deals, real and a deal and sell the exclusive rights to one publisher or seal so sell the exclusive rights to another publisher in a different country, hopefully they didn't see it. I mean, there's always been business in music. That's what Florida was once you know? And um, I mean, it's, it's great to focus on the art part of it. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, I, I want to think about Shakespeare's, uh, the, the, the various rankings that were going on with his plays when I see Azure Like It or something. I just want to see the play. But if you're going to train people to go into the business, they probably ought to learn something about the business. Um, and so if people have got um, an attitude about that, I just think they have to get over it. Um, and I think what gets them over it is the other business, which is the business of tuition revenue. <laughs> yes. So you want to talk about revenues, I mean, let's just talk about how we're going to pay you next year. You know, you're not going to have any money to go to conferences for a couple of years because our enrollments are down. You start talking that way, all of a sudden those same people, they seem to have a different attitude on this. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It changes minds fast. <laughs> That sounds cynical. I don't mean to. It's, it's just that that's the realities of it. Are when you start, sometimes you have to dig down a little further, but when you really dig down, you know, most people are concerned with some element of the business of this. Well, it's noon. I'm sure there's other uh, interesting questions and comments that uh, yeah. you'd like to bring to John. Uh, please uh, feel free to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you.